Well, the most celebrated holiday around the world each year, the one that generates more attention, the one that causes more decorations and more gift buying, the one that more people anticipate from any other special day is what? Christmas, Christmas you got it. And as we prepare our hearts to worship and celebrate the birth of Jesus, our Savior, we're launching into a new message entitled The Gifts, specifically gifts for the king. We're going to look at different gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. I think most of us know the story how Jesus was born in Bethlehem. At that time, King Herod was ruling over the land, and there are some wise men that came to visit. They're also called the Magi. They traveled a great distance for the purpose to come and worship him. Now, I believe everyone here has seen a nativity set, like one up here. If you remember, you, before we built the sanctuary, we used to actually have a live nativity. This Sunday, with the first Sunday of December, we would have a live nativity right here, right where, we're seat, where you're seated now. And so when you see a nativity scene, how many wise men do you see at the nativity scene? Three. You always see three, don't you? But how many wise men were there? We don't know. <laughs> We get three because of the three gifts, but we don't know for sure. There could have been a dozen wise men. We just don't know for sure. But what we do know is these wise men were highly educated, incredibly wealthy, and they were desperate to meet the one who might be the Savior of the world. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. This is going to be our main text for this week and the next two weeks. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 10 and 11. It says, when they saw the star, they being the wise men, the magi, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's Christmas this year. Not only were the wise men not at the stable, but... They went to the house. That's what it tells us here. It's believed that Jesus was probably anywhere from 18 to 24, 26 months old. Now, if you've had a child that gone through that age, there's a reason they call it the terrible twos, right? <laughs> Can you imagine having these wise men come in and you got the terrible twos running around? Now, we don't know what he was like, but that's probably the situation. What we do know is that these wise men came and they brought gifts. And these gifts had tremendous symbolism. Today, you know, when a couple is expecting a baby, they're often given a shower, right? Uh, it wasn't too long ago. Remember Luke and Allison, uh, they had a baby shower for, for John Boy, and, and they got clothes and diapers and blankets and stuff. That's usually what you get. But what does Jesus get for gifts? He gets gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What kind of baby gifts are those? Folks, understand, these three gifts are not only valuable, but they were incredibly practical and deeply spiritual. In fact, all Bible scholars agree these gifts were not only useful for this family, but they also foreshadowed some of the images of what Jesus would represent. Gold, valuable in itself, represents the kingship of Jesus. Myrrh represents Jesus as a suffering servant, the Lamb of God. And today we're looking at frankincense. Now, many of the staff here have gone to church all their lives, like some of the testimonies, and they've heard many, many Christmas messages. But I asked them, what does frankincense smell like? And none of them knew. So what I have here is a bottle of essential oil frankincense. And after service, if you want to know what frankincense smells like, you can come and smell it. It's free of charge. But I think it's important. We talk about the stuff that we ought to know exact what, we're, what, it, what it smells like. We hear it over and over again. Now, before I tell you the meaning of frankincense, let me tell you a little bit about it. According to my essential oil advisors, which I have a plethora of, <laughs> frankincense is kind of like the Swiss Army knife of essential oils. In, in other words, it has many, many purposes. This is what I know about frankincense. The oil possesses antiseptic, astringent, carminative, diuretic, digestive, sedative, and uterary properties. Now, I'm not sure all that means. I'm not sure how it works, but that's what they say about it. But I do know this. It is extremely expensive, yet it was a very practical gift. And this is what it was used for back in Jesus' day. Frankincense was used to help heal sickness or to treat wounds. 
Frankincense was used to help heal sicknesses or to treat wounds. Frankincense was also the oil that the priest would use during sacrifices. It was the oil the priest would use during sacrifices to burn the incense to make the smoke that would rise up to heaven, symbolizing the prayers of the people rising in faith to God. And thirdly, we see that frankincense represents the priestly line of Jesus. It represents Jesus, our high priest. Now, why is that so important? What's the big deal? Well, in Scripture, the priest's primary role was to be a representative of the people before God. According to the Bible, the priest's primary role is to be a representative of the people before God. And now the priest had, had two functions. His primary role was broken down in two major functions. The first function is the priest made sacrifices for the people for forgiveness of sins. The first function was make sacrifices of forgiveness for, the, for, for sins. A priest would take an innocent animal, sacrifice it, represents the forgiveness of people's sins. And secondly, the second function is the priest prayed prayers on behalf of the people of God. The priest prayed prayers on behalf of the people of God, representing people to God. Now, let's consider these two functions as we see Jesus as our great high priest who offers sacrifices and prayers. We know since the very moment back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve made a choice, they chose to disobey God, we see from that very moment there have been two opposing forces on this world. One is the holiness of God and the other is the sinfulness of mankind. So at the very beginning, right back there in the Garden of Eden, there's these two opposing forces, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. Now, in our culture today, we don't want to talk about sin, do we? It's kind of a harsh word. We we don't say we sinned. Oh, maybe we made a mistake now and then, but, but we really don't say we sinned. And today's philosophy is if it feels good, do it. And if it feels good, it must be true for me. Now, what's true for me may not be true for you, so you live your life, I'll live my life. We, we kind of boil things down to, you just mind your own business. Remember I've shared before how songs are the common man's philosophy? Let me read you the words of a song. Mind your own business. Well, if you mind your own business, then you won't be minded mine. Isn't that the world we live in today? You just leave me alone. One person said that, that sin is such an outdated term. I mean, do we really need to use the word sin anymore? After all, we got Elf on the Shelf, right? <laughs> I mean, he's watching. He's keeping track of you. And you know what he does? He reports back to the big guy. And the big guy's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. So we really don't need sin because we got Elf. Elf will keep our kids in line. <sighs> you see, we have to understand the reality of sin. Because there's the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And if we don't understand the holiness of God, we'll always have a casual approach to sin. Please understand that. If we don't understand the holiness of God, we will always have a casual approach to sin. Until we understand what it truly means that God is holy, we will never realize the cost and the tragedy of what sin does to us. You see, God is holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, starting verse 1, it says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Flying above God are these astonishing beings called seraphim. Their word literally means burning ones. Apparently they live so close to the presence of God they burn with holy brilliance. And they're mentioned again in the book of Revelation. Revelation 4.8 says, And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now let me ask your parents, why do you say the same thing over and over and over and over again to your children? Why do you do that? You want them to get it, right? Repetition. Repetition is a way of indicating emphasis. 
And the Lord is absolutely holy. He's set apart from all others. He is the exalted king of the world. Our God is holy, amen? And what does he want from us? What does he do for us? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, when we hear the word blessings, what do we tend to think of? We, we tend to think of money, position, or possessions, or opportunities. But understand, when Paul uses the word blessed here, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ, when Paul uses that word blessed, he's referring to spiritual relationship and, and position. You see, Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness of our sins. He offers us a free gift of salvation. He offers us the ability to spend all eternity with him. That's what Paul's talking about him, about here in, in verse 3. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, then here it is, the second part of the verse, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What is it that God wants for you and for me? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Folks, I want to be very, very clear this morning. God's goal is not to make you happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Life is not about us being comfortable, successful, and pain-free. You want to be a man or a woman of God, what does he want from you? He wants us to be holy men and women. He wants us to love one another, encourage one another, build one another up. He says that we should be holy without blame before him in love. That's what God's desire is for us. But what does it mean? What does it mean when it says God is holy? Folks, understand in both the Greek and the Hebrew, both the Old Testament and New Testament, the word simply means separate. What is God? God is transcendently separate. Our, our God is perfect in every single way. He's flawless. He's pure. There is no fault. There's no wrong in Him. There's no stain on Him. God is above and beyond the range of normal or merely physical human experience. God is separate. He is perfect. And so we need to understand that holiness isn't just one of the attributes of God. Holiness is the perfection of all His attributes. His power is holy. His grace is holy. His mercy is holy. His glory is holy. It's His holiness, His purity, that makes Him worthy of all honor and glory and praise. That's what we should focus on. God is holy, and we're not. And this is our challenge. Not a one of us, not a one of us is holy. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, the entire human race was plunged into sin. You know, the New England Primer, which was the primary textbook for teaching children in America for the first hundred and some years, it taught the alphabet, and they, the children had to recite this, had to learn it, memorize it. A is for Adam. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. B is for the Bible. Thy life to men, this book attend. Wouldn't it be great if that was the foundation of our public schools today? You see, they were not only teaching them to read and write the alphabet, but they were also teaching them a moral foundation. We are all sinners. That's what the Bible teaches. We're all born with a sin nature. And notice what it says, we've all sinned and fall short. Now it's important that we understand that phrase, fall short, that is a present tense, stressing continuous action. The simple fact is that none of us can measure up to God's holy standard by ourselves. There's no works that we can do good enough to, to measure up to bring glory to God. None of us are holy. Not you, not me, not that person you work with, this really good person, or that person you go to school with, this really good person. None of us. Scripture teaches every single one of us have sinned. We've all done something. We've all fallen short of God's standard. You see, God has set the bar of holiness, and not a one of us can reach it. We have fallen short of God's standards, and because of sin, it breaks the intimacy with a holy God. And God hates sin. It's everything that God is not. It's the opposite of holy, holiness. It disrupts our intimacy it ruins our fellowship with Him. Sin separates us from God and it destroys our life. 
It causes a broken world. That's why God hates sin so much. Now in the Old Testament, once a year, remember the high priest would go in and make a sacrifice, a temporary payment for sins of the people. It was known as the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. On that day, the priest would sacrifice an innocent animal. They would take it into the tabernacle behind the veil, a place known as the Holy of Holies. Remember what would happen? A priest would go in there. They'd have a little bell sewn on the bottom of their robe, and they'd have a rope tied to their ankle because if they went in there and they offered a sacrifice in the wrong way, God would strike them dead. And so the other priest would stand out there listening, and if they didn't hear the bells ringing, they'd start pulling their buddy out because he was dead. God took this very seriously. The priest would go in and light the frankincense and the smoke would rise up to heaven. It represented the cries of the people asking God for mercy. And then the priest would take the blood of an innocent animal and he'd sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And this would symbolize the death of an innocent one to play in the place of the guilty one as payment for sins. But then there was a second animal. Has anyone ever heard of the word scapegoat? Yeah, that's pretty popular nowadays, isn't it? Do you know what comes right out of Scripture? In Leviticus chapter 16. In Leviticus chapter 16, I encourage you to read that chapter. There's a lot there to, to, to take in. I just want to highlight a couple of verses. In verse 8 it says, Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Understand there's two goats. One's going to go in and be sacrificed and the other's going to be the scapegoat. We go over to verse 20. It says, And when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to the uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. So understand what happened here. The one goat, they'd slit his throat, take the blood and take it in for an offering. The other goat, Aaron, or or the priest, would would take and put his hands on the head of the goat as a symbol, symbol of transferring all the sins of the people onto this goat. The goat was taken out into the wilderness and sent off. And sometimes they'd run it off over the cliff. Make sure it wouldn't come back. So the first animal died as a sacrifice, paying the price for sins, and the scapegoat was run out of the community, symbolizing the sins have been separated from God. Now, this pretty, sounds pretty strange to us today, right? Can you imagine if Peter were living back in that day? <laughs> they would have a heyday with this, this method. You take this cute little animal, you slit its throat, you put its blood into the bucket, And then you take the blood and you place it on the mercy seat. And you pray. And here's what we need to understand, folks. Because God is just, he must punish sin. Because God is just, he must punish sin. But God is not only just, he's also merciful. And so here's the beauty of what God does. Don't miss this. The sacrifice satisfies God's justice and at the same time extends mercy to people that he loves so much. The sacrifice satisfies God's justice and at the same time extends mercy to people that he loves so much. It's talking about you and me. This was a temporary covering under the old covenant, but remember, we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And God had a plan all along that would solve the problem of a sacrifice once and for all. In Hebrews chapter 9, in Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 12, it says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Dead works here refers to the Levitical rituals that can never, never, never give new life. It refers to all the religious activity that men and women try to do today that that will never, never bring us to that point of being right with God because it's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we can be in a right relationship with God the Father. And so this dead works is talking about that. And it says only Jesus can cleanse your conscience from dead works. We're free from our guilt, from our sinful past, that we can serve the living God. That's what he does for us. 
And it goes on in verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. That's what he offers to us. You see, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. God's will is for us to be made holy. Remember a couple weeks ago, we were looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He said, be holy as I am holy. Earlier, we looked at Ephesians 1, 4, that we should be holy. But the truth is, we're not holy in ourselves. But it's God's will for us to be holy. How's that going to happen? We've all sinned. We all fall short. How's this going to work out? Folks, there's only one way by faith in the sacrifice of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's the only way. There's only one way, and that is by faith trusting in Jesus Christ and his shed blood that we can have eternal life. You see, under the Old Testament, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day after day, offering the same sacrifice again and again and again and again. And the disturbing thing about this is the sacrifice never takes away the sin. It's only temporary. It's a, it's a temporary covering of the sin, but it never takes it away. But our high priest, named Jesus Christ, offered himself to God the Father as a single sacrifice for our sins, good for all time. Jesus gave his life. He, he gave his innocent life's blood as a covering for our sins, satisfying the justice of God, and he extends the mercy of God to his creation, to you and me who he loves so much. That's what God does for us. And what God says, he calls us. He said, hey, Bob, I want you to take off that dirty shirt. And what do we say? Oh, our shirt's comfortable. Just got it broke in. No, it's, it's fine, I'm good. Hey, son, I want you to take that shirt off. I don't want to. And you got to understand, this, this shirt covers my heart. And written on my heart, or all the things I've done wrong. Alcoholism and drugs and pornography and gambling and gluttony. God, why do you have to bring that right up after Thanksgiving? And, and lust and lying and cheating and gossiping and selfishness. And the worst one of all is pride. No, no, no. I, I, I'll just keep this on covered up. God says, you're not fooling me. I know that. Yeah, but I can fool the rest of these people if I, I keep this covered up. He says, son, take off your shirt. You see, I have to make a choice. Every single one of us do. Do we obey God? Do we do what he says? There finally comes a point, it's okay, God, I give up. You can have my old dirty shirt. And that's when God says, son, look what I have for you. I got the jacket of righteousness that Jesus wants to put on you. And when you put this jacket of righteousness on, you know what I see? I don't see any of those sins. I don't see any of that stain. I see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I see all those sins stamped paid in full. Whenever I look at you, I see the coat of Jesus that he gave to you. And whenever I look at you, I, I do not see any sinfulness anymore. I see the righteousness that Jesus gave to you. Do you see how Jesus' sacrifice satisfies God's justice and yet it shows his mercy? Jesus is not some distant Savior far away that we can't call on. He is a high priest who understands and cares about everything that we're going through in our life. In Hebrews, again, in chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have this great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Folks, it's important we understand this word sympathize. It means to suffer with. It's a, a term uh, expressing compassion. It's not just, oh, I feel sorry for you that you're going bad. No, no. This term means that he enters into our suffering and our hurt and our struggle. He takes on our pain. That's what that word means. He sympathizes with our weakness. The word weakness literally means without strength. And that word is used throughout the Bible to include physical illnesses. 
It, it includes financial needs. It can refer to any limitation of humanity. Folks, understand, Jesus experienced human weakness, disappointment, betrayal, and intense pain. So we can go to him with everything because he's, we've experienced nothing that he has not already experienced in even greater measure. We have a great high priest who really understands. You know, so many times we're hurting and someone comes along and, and they try and, and, and help us through and, and we'll look at him and say, well, you don't understand. You don't understand. Well, they're probably right. I don't. But Jesus does. He understands. He feels our pain. He takes it on himself. So what should we do? Well, look what it says in verse 16. Let us, there go, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We should come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, our high priest is Jesus Christ. He understands the weakness, the struggles that we have. And because he faced all the same tests that we do, yet he never sinned. I hope you will understand and embrace this truth that whatever you're going through, Jesus understands. He, he relates to the trials and the troubles that we have. He, he sympathizes with our pain. Whatever you're going through at this very moment, He understands. If we feel stressed right now, overwhelmed by the situation, He understands. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? He, his friends had abandoned Him and He knew what was ahead. And what did He do? He fell down and prayed, My soul is overwhelmed, overwhelmed in agony at the point of death. He understands. You face anxiety, he understands. You have friends that have betrayed you, stabbed you in the back. Remember what Judas did? Kissed him as a sign of this is the guy. He understands what it's like to be betrayed. You deal with crazy people in your family. Probably nobody here has that, right? Jesus understands. Remember when he said he was the Messiah, what happened? His, his family came and they're going to pull him aside and kind of keep him off. They thought he was a lunatic. And I think as a spiritual principle, every family has one. <laughs> Someone that, you oh, let's just keep him off to the side. <laughs> Remember this, Jesus was conceived out of wedlock. Now, we don't know for sure, but, but some scholars believe that Mary was as young as 13, possibly 12 years old when she conceived. And, and when confronted, oh, God, the Holy Spirit, oh yeah, that'll go over real big, right? Folks, don't forget, Jesus grew up in a small town. Now, if you live in a small town, you know what it's like. Everybody knows your business, right? Can you imagine what was said about Jesus? There's the one, the illegitimate boy. Oh, yeah, his mother said God's his father, right? And remember, back in those days, there was only rich and poor. And Jesus wasn't rich. He lived in poverty. He would have been criticized. He would have been ridiculed. He probably was bullied. He was tempted by the devil again and again and again. And when he was at his weakest, most vulnerable point, and yet he did not sin. Jesus experienced the death of a close friend. He grieved the loss of a family member. He was accused of things he did not do. He was betrayed by friends that broke his promise. Remember, remember Peter said, Oh, Hey, Jesus, don't worry. All these other guys will leave you, but you can count on me, the big fisherman. And then what happened? Oh, I don't know him. I never heard of him. No, no, no. I don't know who he is. Three times, three times he denied him. Jesus understands what it's like to be hurt by a friend. And then worst of all, as he hung on the cross, suffering from the torture that he had endured, he felt abandoned by his father. Now, of course, we know that he wasn't abandoned by God, but we know he felt abandoned. Jesus, the great high priest, became sin for us. Like the scapegoat, he gave his life for sin. And as Jesus hung there on the cross, God looked away. Jesus cried out in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt forsaken by God? Do you ever feel like God has abandoned you? He doesn't care about you anymore? Do you ever think, why wasn't he even born? I'm worthless. Jesus understands. Jesus understands what it's like. He's been there. 
He's felt it. Wherever you hurt, he hurts. He is our great priest who sympathizes and understands. Listen, so many people have this idea of Jesus, that Jesus is set up in heaven looking down, oh, sorry to be you, buddy. Tough luck. Too bad. That's the idea many people have of God. That's not what Jesus is doing at all. He, he's in heaven interceding for us. Jesus is our high priest who experiences all the pain of having a human body. All the emotions, all the rejection, all the loneliness of abandonment. Think about this. God born in the form of a child who loves you and cares for you. And God in his divine providence sent magi, sent wise men to offer gifts prophetically. Declaring the nature of Jesus. Gold, he is our king. Myrrh, Jesus is our suffering servant, the perfect lamb of God. And frankincense, Jesus is our high priest who would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins, praying prayers to God in heaven on our behalf. Today, more than ever, today, more than ever, we are consumed by fear and confusion. You only have to watch the news People are panicking. They, they talk about the pandemic again and everybody rushes the store and buys out all the toilet paper, right? <laughs> Come on. Our world is consumed with fear, confusion, anger. And what should we be doing? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Come boldly, literally means God's people do not have to fear being turned away. Listen, when you call out to God, you don't hear, oh, we're sorry, all lines are busy right now, please try again. Oh, we're sorry, we're booked up until May of 2021, you can't get an appointment with God now. Oh, you're too sinful, we, we don't deal with people like you. You're not going to hear that. What do we do? We come boldly. We never have to hide anything from God. We can be honest with God in our prayers. You know, we think we can hide things in here and, and we can hide them from somebody else, but we can't hide them from God. He knows what's in our heart. He knows what we've done. I don't know why we're so foolish that we can't be honest with Him and just pour it out to Him. God gives mercy for our past failures. He gives grace for our present need. Come boldly. Come boldly to Jesus for what? For help. The word help means that Jesus, our great high priest, it wants to assist and sustain his people in weakness during difficult time. And notice what it says, in the time of need, that phrase means at just the right time, at the perfect time. Folks, this should give us comfort knowing that we can come to Jesus because he cares for us. We can come to him and we can boldly come before him. We don't have to cower in fear. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to pray in some special way. All you that are dads, especially dads of daughters, you're going to get this. When my girls are small, come home from work, one of the things they do is climb up on my lap and at a rocking chair and I'd rock them and I'd, I'd sing them every Johnny Cash song I knew. <laughs> they didn't care. <laughs> and then I'd hear them, they get on my lap and go to their mom. You know what they tell their mom? When I grow up, I'm going to marry Daddy. There wasn't anything I wouldn't do for my girls. You know, that's exactly the way God the Father is with us. He loves us. He cares about us. He, he wants to be in a deep relationship with us. How long has it been since you really, really enjoyed God? How long has it been since you just really experienced His touch in a new and a fresh way? If you're hurting today, tell him. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Give him those hurts. In your own way, in your own style, just go to God and talk to him. Hand him all the junk that you're dealing with. Ask him to help you get beyond these problems. Today we're going to do something a little different. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. The worship team is going to lead us in a closing song. And while we're singing that song, I want to encourage you to take this opportunity to connect with God. Whatever works for you. If it's coming, kneeling down the front, do that. If it's sitting in your chair, standing, going off the corner, whatever works. Don't worry about what the people around you think. Be concerned about what God thinks. God, I want to connect with you today. So you do whatever is necessary. And then after the worship team finishes the song, I'm going to come back and I'm going to close us in prayer.
But I encourage you, use this time to connect with our Heavenly Father. He loves us. He cares about us. He tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. If you're able, would you stand with me? Worship, he's going to lead us in a song. Use this time to connect with God our Father.